Yo, 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 what's rocking, everybody, man? This is Kyron Montero, man, back with episode number four. I got a good homie of mine, advisor, big brother, entrepreneur, Keenan Davis. What's, what's rocking, man? man? Not much, man. Appreciate you coming, man. We're here at the Frequency Canvas studio, and um, I had to get this brother here, man. He is a, a gym with a lot of knowledge. He is an entrepreneur, he is a man of God, he's a father, he's a husband, community activist, a muscle builder. A muscle That's new. Okay. <laughs> muscle builder. Ain't been able to wear a medium t-shirt since he was in third grade because he's been buffed that long. The homie King Davis, man. Give him a round of applause, man. What's up, man? Pleasure to be here, man. Appreciate you, man. So, I got cool with you. 2020 yeah and it kind of was ironic how we how we got cool uh i was hitting you up about i think seeing about some insurance for for a business idea that i've had and then we kind of just got connected from there yeah i expected to meet with you about 10 minutes and get a quote and keep it moving and we end up talking probably about an hour or two. Oh yeah and then we for the last couple of years we've just been building and keenan is a good dude man so you you own several businesses. Can you can you elaborate on? We'll get to that. But can first let's start off talking about how you grew up. Okay. How you came up in in Marion Muncie yeah. area, and then kind of navigate how you got into yeah business. Well, the that's uh, really the the biggest story that I wanted to share um, after I achieved a level of success um, because. I came back to my hometown. So I'm originally from Marion. Right, right. And I grew up, I was 22 years in Muncie. So for those who don't know where Muncie is compared to Marion, it's, you know, it's, uh, what, 35 minutes south of Marion. So not too far. Ball State. It's known for Ball State, Bonzi Wells. Um, so I was born in Marion, um, single parent uh, with my mom and my sis, little sister. And we grew up on Adams Street downtown. I mean, Central Marion. Um, so at 12 years old, um, by by 12, man, I had experienced a lot of stuff. And I've been exposed to a lot of stuff as a kid that a kid probably shouldn't have been exposed to. So drugs, sex, violence, alcoholism, um, you name it, man, I was exposed to it before I left to go to Muncie. Mm. And single parent mom, you know, so she don't know, you know, what boys, boys go through. So... Um, I moved to um, Muncie. My mom goes back to school to finish her degree. And um, while I'm in Muncie, man, it's it's just me. You know, I ain't got no family, no friends, none of that. And um, I had to figure, I had to grow up quick. And it was like, I came to the conclusion that um, I'm, a, I'm an army of one. It's me. No one's going to take care of me but me, you know, because that's all I had. So um, I was in Muncie, man, for 22 years and went through a lot of drama, man. I was um, heartache, you know, and I was a I was a player. I will admit it on online. <laughs> I was hey, I was called the Pentecostal pimp, <laughs> you know, and uh, I I'm not proud of that. But that was uh, that was what I was going through, man, and. Uh, uh, I was trying to find my way, but at the same time, trying to find acceptance and love and um, just be appreciated mm -hmm. and all these different emotional things, man, simply because um, of the relationship I had with my, my parents, you know. So I didn't know that until I got older and looked back, but those 22 years I spent there. So um, I was there, but that's where I found God and I got my life straight, found my current wife. And we moved back here um, reluctantly because I was trying to go south. We mm. was looking at Houston, you know, and I got my degree. We was like, man, I'm about to we about to move. So uh, my wife got her first job at the high school as an art teacher. So she was getting her. She got her master's degree. And then uh, man, she was at a, a, a career fair at Ball State and Arena. Man, the principal at the time saw her said, hey. Uh, it was kind of weird because she said, I mean, he asked, are you looking for a job as an art teacher? She's not wearing anything showing that. And she said, yeah, how'd you know? 
He said, I figured that's what you was at. That's what you were applying for at the table. Hey, if you go to Marion tomorrow, put in your application, you got a job. Mm. It was that quick. You know, so what could I say? So I was like, God, I'm not trying to move back to Marion. At the time, Marion was trash. Marion had nothing going on, no restaurants. You would even come and nothing was moving, you know? Yeah. Like the city wasn't moving. Yeah. And I was like, God, please don't send me back there. Don't don't send me back there. And um, I was having nightmares, man. But then one dream was I went, to, I came to Marion, and I looked back, and everything was black. I didn't have a pathway back to Muncie. So I followed it, man. I got here. I said, God, I just have one, one request, that you don't let me live like I was when I left. I don't want to be poor. I don't want to be broken. I don't want to be just subpar. But if I come back to Marion, I'm leaving my footprint. You know, I'm going to change something. You're going to remember me. So uh, we came here, man, and got the bomb deal on the house, and everything just worked out, you know. Um, so I've been here ever since. But uh, but my my motive of being here was I got to be an agent of change. Mm. So we're going I'm gonna rearrange some some questions because of how you how you just laid it out. So tell us I'm gonna give you a back to back question. Okay. Tell us how how you found faith and then how you and your wife got together. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna say how I Okay, I'll go okay, okay. So I was married before though. You know, so this is my okay. second marriage. Okay. You know. So uh, the first one was, yeah, that was, I was, I, I learned a lot, to say the least. I learned a lot. So um, I, I was raised in the church, Greater Second, you know, is where I went to church. Shout yeah. out to Greater Second Baptist Church. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, Pastor J.D. Williams. Yeah, shout out to the legendary J.D. Williams. Yeah, that man was clean, boy. That, that was a clean dude. Man, that dude got on me so many times for not wearing suits to church. Yes. You don't come up in this house, right. in guy's house. <laughs> right, suspenders, man. I was a little kid. He told me he's put suspenders on. I said, man, I ain't got, I thought it was for the gut. You know, pull up of your, I'm lean, dog. I don't want to, you know, he said suspenders. You got to wear the suspenders. But he was a, he was a, he was a very pivotal because he was highly intelligent, highly intelligent man. But And only had like a, a second or third grade education. Yeah, yeah, military. Yeah. Yeah, and his real name was J.D. Yep. You know, <laughs> so... Um, but <clears throat> so I was raised in church, man, and it was Baptist. So my mom sung in the choir. I was on the usher team and we was going to church four days a week. <laughs> you know, you had rehearsals, you had church, you had Bible study, and then you had, uh, what? I don't know what else, something throughout the week. So I was at church like four days a week, but church was a formality. It wasn't real. It was you know, because as a kid, man, for I, I put a lot of thought behind stuff. I was able to think, looking back, my memory and the way I would look at things and ask the question, why? At a little young age, man, I had that ability. So I'm going to church and I would start. I started to read like third. You know, I was reading by six, by third grade, man, I was in it. I was reading my Bible like like crazy. And I'm reading the Bible and I'm going, I wonder if. God, who who uh, causes the sun to rise, God created the sun in Genesis. So why is everybody worried about a light bill? You know, <laughs> if he if he commands the sun, why are you worried about a light bill? Why can't your God, the God that we serve, pay your light bill? Why are your lights cut off? You know, if he owns a cattle on a thousand hills and he provides according to his riches, why are you hungry? Why you know what I'm saying so or why are you broke? What's going on with the God that we serve? So I kind of like just shunned it. Like this is what we do on Sundays. You know, it wasn't real. So by the time I got to Muncie, it was a different story. It was Pastor uh, W. J. Jackson, another legend, legend man. He's mad, pivotal men in my life. So um, Pastor uh, J. D. Williams taught me excellence, like in poise. You know that man was clean, poise, man. Pastor J.D. Williams, man, was a leader. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, this dude was a dynamic leader. Yeah. And I loved him, man. I was I was placed up under him, and he was like, he told me, he said, Kenan, um, I need you to be right beside me 
because where I leave off is where I want you to take off from. And I'm looking at him like at 14 years old going, my God, the way you break down the Bible, the way that you understand the scriptures, I don't know if I'll ever get there. And he's like, you're going to surpass me. And I'm going, there's no way, you know, because he saw he was so big in my eyes. But he taught me leadership. He taught me how to be a man, how to persevere, how to be disciplined. You mm-hmm. know, that man was highly disciplined. And um, so I was up underneath him and I learned discipline. That's when I got my preacher's license at 24. Mm. So I was traveling and preaching and doing my thing. And then God cut it. Now I got married too at that time. Mm. So man, there was a period at like, age 26, 25, my life just got rocky. I'm preaching, but then in my spirit, I'm going, there so, has to be more than this. You know, it has to be more than this because I'm going, I'm preaching to the choir, you know, I'm preaching and these dudes are still doing the same sin they was doing 10 years ago, five years ago. Nothing's changing. You know, I'm, it's almost like I'm putting on a show and I'm going, this ain't right. So at that time, you know, God started speaking to me more, started to recognize his voice more. And, uh, by 26, man, God, I got a divorce. My wife left. Um, I lost my job. I lost my car. I was homeless, you know, and I'm going, God, what's going on? And God took me back to the Bible. And he said, every great man in the Bible goes through these wilderness experiences where who you thought you was before, that ain't who you are. Mm. I take you through the wilderness, take you through the testing, and then I rename you and I give you your purpose. So Moses, Abraham, Joseph, all of them, you know, there's greats throughout the Bible um, that go through these experiences with God where it's like, God, did you leave me? He's going to know I'm showing you who you really are. Mm. And then I'm going to rename you and then show you your identity. And then now you live according to your new birth and your new identity. So I went through this period, man, of like two, three years of man of just wilderness, man. And by age 30, he gave me my wife back. That's who I'm married to now. She's an awesome woman. Um, Tashima Davis. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I married, I, she, he showed me her. And then I, um, yeah, we got married. And then I started going to a different church. So I now went to that's my third church. So I went to a different church, man. And this church was really all about uh like depending on God, relationship. You know, we gonna so we gonna worship God, we're gonna praise God. You know, my old church, it wasn't like that. But that these mothers, they be dancing, you know. <laughs> I ain't never shouting, you know. So I get there, they speaking in tongues and they shouting and prophesying and stuff, and I'm going, okay, you know, I can get with this because it, it helps me. Where at where I'm where I'm at in my life. I need to build relationship with God. I know how to serve him, but he ain't he's not real to me, you know. So I began to like really dig in and and really grasp prayer and the prophetic and that those sort of things where it's more spiritual instead of just duty. I'm just serving God. And man, my life from that point just took off. I started reading and started studying history of things and and God was allowing me to get the depth and the meat of the Bible. And um, at the same time, um, the church wasn't really, I was growing faster than the rest of the church. Mm. So I'm learning things, but they're not, they're not receiving it. And then I'm going, why God, why, why? He said, for one, this was just an incubator for, for you to grow. So now I want you to take everything that you've learned and go to the world. That's your church. That's who you preach to. That the, the harvest is plentiful. I was like, well, harvest in Muncie? No. You're going back to your hometown. Mm. So in a nutshell, it all culminated to me going out, going through this experience, man, in my life, finding my wife, coming together, coming back to my hometown to do work. You know, um, and you've so, been working, so yeah. let's get a homie another round of uh, a <laughs> another another round of applause, man. Dog, that's that's a lot. So, man, so coming up in greater second, then moving to Muncie under Pastor Jackson, mm-hmm. uh, being homeless, marriage, failed marriage, 
reconnecting faith, getting back, uh, getting to the wife that you have now. Y'all got uh, kids together. Yeah. Now you're back in marrying. So you come through all of that. You're back. you like, yo, I don't want to come back broke. Mm-hmm. I don't want to come back broken. I don't want to be shell par. Like, I got to great. I got to be great. Right. I got to leave a legacy. And so since you've been back, you're a business owner of several businesses. You sit on different boards. You serve in different ways of the community, which is here in Marion, Indiana. Mm-hmm. For those of y'all that may not uh, know the city that we're talking about, tell people how you got into entrepreneurship, the businesses that you own and how you serve in the community. And the reason that I say all of that is because you serve in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. but you don't really, you're not braggy about it. And people, you just kind of move silently. Yeah. You know, you're a silent killer. Um, but this is the time to expose all that silence. I guess so. You asked. So, yeah. So tell, so once again, tell people about what made you get into entrepreneurship and the businesses that you own and, and break them down however uh, you feel comfortable to and then how you serve in the community. Okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> I was uh, I went to Ball State uh, okay. initially right out of high school, and I had no clue what I was going to do. I, I, cause I, was, I used to be an artist, mm. you know, and award, state, state award-winning artist, if, you know, believe it or not. Um, so I thought I was going to go to school for art. Okay. Landscaping, urban planning, something. And I had to submit a portfolio. And the portfolio got stolen during the summer of me going from my senior year to my freshman year. Mm. So right when I got ready to submit it to um, the School of uh, Architecture, got stolen. So I was heartbroken. So what's my second love? Exercise science. So I went to Ball State for that. Man, but going to Ball State, not being firm, man, uh, <laughs> I was all over the place, all over the place. So at a young age, I had no, I didn't know what I was good at, but I was, I'm actually good at everything I do, but I didn't have a passion for anything. Yeah. So that's, that's big, man. For these kids going to school, we got to get them solid before they go, you know, have somebody lead them through that. It's, that's real important. So I didn't actually find out what I was good at, man, until probably 28 years old. And that's when I was coming out of that uh, homeless port, homeless part of my life. Mm. So I prayed to God, God, <clears throat> you remade me. What do you want me to do? I need a career. I need some money. So I was broke. Man, out the blue, Tyson Foods called me to be a supervisor in a factory. Mm. So I went from zero to making fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. And I said, whoa, God is good. Man, that job took me through... So many ups and downs, some prejudice stuff, a lot of prejudice stuff, you know, and it it built me and fortified me and taught me how to be a leader first. So by the time I left, man, I had transitioned some things that was out of order there and took a third of the workforce because they said, if you leave, we leave. That's how good of a leader I became. Mm. And I was, I didn't even know I was good at leadership. I didn't think I was, you know, so I was at Tyson Foods. And then I transitioned from Tyson Foods to Weaver Popcorn. Weaver Popcorn, I was a machine operator, and that's when we was moving back here. So uh, I was a machine operator, and then I got sick. And they was like, well, Keenan, uh, let's put you out on the mezzanine driving a fork truck. I was like, what? I can't drive a fork truck. So I got out there, man, and uh, same thing happened, man. I ended up... um, where the lead team leader out there was doubting if I could do the job. I don't know if you can do the job, man. I'm going to have to tell them that, you know, I don't know about you. I don't know about you. Man, in eight months, I got promoted to being over the whole department. Mm. So I'm like, it was, it was leadership was my, is my gift. Within leadership, man, I went from, I was doing logistics at that point, And I went through, um, that's, at that time, I had had uh, maybe 90 credits from Ball State. So God was like, what's going to happen is you're going to get two degrees and I'm going to promote you to one of the highest positions in the plant. Mind you, that, you know, it's mostly Caucasian. That's not a, a place where blacks go to get promoted. You know, <laughs> you know, if we're going to be honest, it's That's not. a fact. So, um, man, they had all the surplus of money. So as I am getting promoted in logistics, 
I take I go get my six sigma black belt. If y'all don't know who that what that is, it's methodologies that you use to improve the work processes in industry and business. Mm. So it's a very high and rare certification that you get. So at the time I'm getting promoted in logistics and um I'm over the whole department. I get a Six Sigma certification and two degrees from um, Indiana Wesleyan in business and religious studies, all paid for. Nobody, no, you know, nobody's taking advantage of the money. I said, God, well, thank you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, but it was just, you know, following God. So I became real good at that, at logistics, you know, and just complex thought process and troubleshooting, you know. So I'm going, I don't want to be in logistics, but I like it. So I'm just going to roll with it. So, uh, so things went down with, uh, we were popcorn. I went to Walmart and, uh, I got hurt. So, uh, I couldn't work at Walmart. So as I'm getting paid on sick leave or whatever, um, I'm like, God, what, what do you want me to do? So I ended up going to Chrysler. Same thing, same pattern, pattern, man. I come in as a supervisor and I put everything to work, uh, I get another degree in sports nutrition. No, I got no, I got that later on. But I do have another degree in sports and exercise nutrition. So, but at Chrysler, same thing. Getting promoted, man. Got promoted, got promoted all the way up until it just didn't work. It just yeah, for many reasons. We ain't gonna get into that. But um, as I walked away, all that taught me, man, was how to run business. You know, the ups, the downs, the trials with people. I mean, at one point, I was leading, man, three three hundred and fifty plus employees. That's a lot of people. Yeah, you know, uh, at Walmart, same thing. You know, you're running over one hundred and fifty people at one time, to guiding all these people. Weaver Popcorn, I'm running all these different lines. Plus, what's out? You know, the the trailers that need to come in and doing third party stuff and the warehouse, and I'm running all these different things. So what God was doing. Um, instead of directly saying, hey, Kenny, we're going to take you through some some hardcore business training. He was taking me through hardcore business training. I was just obedient. So I got the degree. He trained me. We worked it out. So by the time I got, man, I walked away from Chrysler and the opportunity where it was almost like God was like, okay, now you're ready. So uh, State Farm called me. I mean, well, they emailed me on uh, LinkedIn. They had been trying to recruit me all year, but I never saw it. But when I was ready, I was able to see it. So I got on there, submitted my resume, and uh, this is where I'm at, man. So, and with that too, uh, I'm running my business. I run that business, and I guess I need to talk about my other one too. Yeah. Okay. So um, I have, you know, State Farm, an insurance agency. Been doing that for four years now. Um, and then I have. I just started my own um, health and supplement health supplements. By uh, it's called um, Refiners Health and Nutrition, and um, that was that was a whole refining process. Though. So it's it's modeled after refining process of God. You go through these hard trials and tribulations, but you come out pure when you learn from them. You come a lot, become a life learner. And then my wife, she this year actually is walking away from being a teacher of twelve years and running. It's called Echo Art Gallery. And man, when I tell you she is an uh, artist extraordinaire, she's artist extraordinaire, man. She does, um, um, what do you call it? murals? Murals, yep. Huge murals. She does commission paintings. She teaches classes. She has her own line of books. So she has eight books out right now. Then she actually has her books all over the nation. She actually did, uh, my man, uh, somebody in Tokyo. Asked that, you know, my man that did the Gundam style thing. Uh-huh. Yeah. She sent that over across seas. She got stuff in Australia. I mean, this woman killing it, man. Just last night, she finished um, doing seven murals at the VA here. Wow. All them boys, they hard. But yeah, man, just shout out to the Echo Art Gallery. She's she killing it. But our whole family, we right now, we're just, we're entrepreneurship, man. And she had to overcome some, some same, the same uh internal struggle man to do the what she's doing so yeah man we out here doing it so hmm so th- there's a lot i can i can go into that so first off let, let's double back to state farm real quick okay obviously you your hope is that as many people <laughs> 
come to State Farm as mu- as much as possible. I myself personally uh, am with Keenan. Uh, my personal li- uh, life insurance and my business insurance mm-hmm. here at this building we're sitting at right now is with his office. Um, there's a lot of young people dying without life insurance. Yep. Drug overdoses, you know, car wrecks, whatever, you know, different causes of deaths. And that leaves a lot of stress on family members left behind to deal with that, with the chaos of that, you know. And it's hard to be grieving. That's that's one thing to lose somebody you love, especially that's younger and unexpected or any age that's, that, you know, that's unexpected. Rather, it's unexpected or not. It's tough in general. But to then have the burden of having to worry if you can bury them or not or right. do whatever is necessary to, to put them to rest. What is the importance of life insurance and, like, walk through that? Because I don't think – people think that that's something I need to get that when I'm older. But then you get older and it costs more. Right. So it's better to get it when you're younger mm-hmm. – and quote unquote healthier because yeah. you can get grandfathered in sometimes yeah. at certain rates. But tell people the importance of life insurance, life insurance and any any insurance that you you yeah. think is important. <clears throat> well, life insurance in general, man, is is not appreciated until you need it. Mm. You know, everybody oh scam. I don't you know I don't want to pay that much for it. Two things, man, is 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 inevitable. You pay for what you get. You know, so if you want to go cheap. When it comes down to you filing a claim, you know, you're going to get a cheap response, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it's real. And then two, you know, you, uh, <laughs> you laugh. yeah, I'm laughing, y'all. So you're going to get you're going to get a cheap response, man. And then you don't recognize that you need insurance until you need insurance. Insurance is assurance. You know, you if I'm if I'm riding and I got a brand new car. I want to be. I want to have some assurance that, hey, if someone t bone my Maserati, I got somebody that can afford to pay to replace my Maserati. You don't want to go out and buy. Uh, I ain't gonna say no names. I'm not gonna say no names. <laughs> I was about to, but you don't want to go out and buy cheap insurance and then wonder, do they have enough assets to pay for my Maserati if it gets total? You know, you don't want that. So you want to go with a company. We've been established, man, for 100 years. Got over a billion dollars in assets. You know, paying out is not an issue. So that's what you want to look for. And um, But, yeah, a lot of people don't understand that, man. You're going to pay for what you get, and then you don't value insurance until you need insurance, you know. But dealing with life, life insurance, man, and especially in our culture, is not uh, – is not uh, there's no emphasis placed on it because a lot of people for generations have never looked into it. There's a reason for that because the wealthy, the wealthy save taxes on money, and and so so I say, say this: uh, say I got an estate, I got an estate, and I don't want the government to take my estate when I die, so I cover it with my life insurance. So like my house right now. Um, if I, I, if I want to keep my house and, and pass it down to generations, I got to make sure that if I die, that they can pay it off, you know. So I want to have my house covered. But a lot of people, the rich do that. So, of course, we ain't going to know. We're not going to know that, you know, hey, to keep my, keep my legacy going, to keep long money going in my family, I got to make sure that it stays in my family. No, we lose everything because we don't know the value of life insurance. Uh, secondly, get life insurance when you when you're younger. Why? Because when you get a whole life, you're making both dividends and interest. So you're making money with your money. If your kids, like my kids, I got insurance on them, man. I'm paying super low rates. So by the time my kids get 18. They got thousands of dollars that they can borrow from themselves. So they don't have to worry about going to a bank if I need a down payment for a car. If I need a down payment for a car, I go to my life insurance, borrow against myself, and pay myself back at a lower interest rate than if I go and go to a bank. Mm -hmm. So plus, 
if the payout, if your if your um death benefit is a hundred thousand and you never touch you don't touch it for twenty years, you're gonna have more than a hundred thousand. You'll have more like a hundred and thirty six thousand dollars by that time. Because all your interest and all that stuff, you can it's just called paid up additions. So you just stick it at the end. So now my death benefit is one thirty six instead of a hundred thousand. But this is how you preserve what you work hard for. You work hard for it, and then you put I put life insurance on my stuff so it can be passed down to my kids. You know, or if I want my kids to succeed, you put all your work into your kids to send them off to college or whatever. You don't want them burdened with, oh my God, I gotta bury my dad. He's gonna lose his car. We gotta sell some stuff to pay off this state. You know, it's traumatizing. And then you got all the all this stuff stacked on top of your trauma. Man, this is how this is how rich people keep stuff going. They keep legacy going. They keep, you know, everything in the family that they work hard for. So life insurance, man, is not a scam. If you get with the right company and you get with the right agent, have him break down like what you gain over five years. How can you borrow against yourself? How what is it long term? What's the benefit of me having whole life? You know. And in some circumstances, like me also, I have both whole and term. So while my kids are with me and I got the majority of my debt, I have a whole life policy for a smaller amount, but then I stack it with this term. So with my term, it covers everything. So as time goes on, you're paying debt off. So you don't need as much coverage. So my term is only for 20 years. So my kids will be gone and my debt will be paid down to this amount that I need with my whole life. Now, mind you, I don't, t- I don't touch my whole life. It's increasing too. So by the time, it's after 20 years, my death benefit goes up and it's, it's enough I need to cover all my all my um, assets. So. Man, hold up, hold up. We got to. <laughs> you can wear button now. <laughs> nah, man. That is, I've never, I've never heard somebody break insurance down like that. Before, because once again, I think not just in black culture, but I think in young culture, people look at life insurance as something like basically we're going to live forever. Yeah. I don't know what you would define as young, but let's say 18 to 50. Mm -hmm. Would you say that? I would even go as low as 25. Okay. 25 and below right now, man, they the ones, they the ones you see out here with these chargers. They buying the chargers as a big liability, but then you ask them to pay for life insurance. Or get good insurance for the charger. They ain't, they don't get the the value, you know, of, of protecting what they got. You know, they are poured into a liability, but don't understand. It. And that's a big thing too, man. It's it's really fine. It's, it's fiscal education. You know, do you understand liability and assets? Because when you understand an asset, you going. I need to build those because that's my net worth. What am I worth? All my assets combined. You got an apartment, some Jordans, and a charger. You you ain't worth nothing, bro. <laughs> you know you got a collection of liabilities, so that's big too, man. That yeah, that's a that's a whole. That's oh, a, dude, that's a whole nother episode right there, man. Okay, so let's talk about the need of. Hold up, let's double back real quick. You own the health nutrition company. Yeah. Talk about, and I need to do better at this. I need to hit the gym. I need to eat better. Talk about the importance of working out and health, eating and drinking right, and and why we need to take that more serious. It seems like you see the younger generations taking it more serious than our parents and grandparents mm-hmm. and great-grandparents did to try to live longer. Right. Um, what What's the importance of good health, man? Well, um, I, I'll tell you what I see, what I observe. So I've been all over the nation. Um, and in the warmer climates, you know, they're a little vain. You know, they're a little vain. So they want to take more, you know, the care of their bodies or whatever. So they can show themselves in the, in the, with the shirts off and bikinis. Right. That's what you're saying. You're right. You know. Okay. Okay. Now, some places in Florida, they, the girls don't care. <laughs> Men don't care either. They got dad bods and stuff like that. They don't care. But you see more... People apt to uh, to take care of themselves in warmer climates. Here in the Midwest, it's the uh, the fattest part of the nation um, because I didn't know that. You know, yeah, 
Yeah, so I mean, most of the nation is obese. They're fat, you know, out of out of shape. I hate the word fat. I don't. I don't want to keep saying that, man. They, they, they's out of shape, you know. But uh, they carry more fat than normal. But um, you know, we we stay covered most of the year. You know, we don't. There's no beaches really around here. You know, nothing like that. They don't even feel like we get a summer no more. Right. It's May right now and it's cold. Right. I got a hoodie on. You know. That's terrible. So, uh, we stay covered up a lot. Um. So with the Midwest, man, it's like it's real hard to detach health from fitness. Health and fitness are two totally different things. All right, explain that. So health, you can be healthy and have no muscles. You can be healthy and not be able to run a marathon. So what health is, when you go to the doctor, you got good cholesterol. You got, uh, you know, your um, blood pressure is good. Um, you know, your, 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 um, your, you're just, your overall internal, like your GI tract is functioning right. Um, all of your internals, you know, are good. You know, you don't have any asthma, you know, you don't have all these ailments and illnesses. Uh, all your vitals are good. That's, that's health. That is true health. You know, you're able to do, to be fully functional, you know, that's health fitness is I can do supply metrics and I can ride my bike at a certain speed for a certain distance and my VO2 max when I get on the treadmill is super high and I can run marathons and I can climb, I can rock climb and I got veins popping and you know, that's fitness. So you can actually be fit and not healthy. You can actually be lean and still be overweight and be uh, to have too much fat, fat content. So true health, man, is, is, is not understood. It's not, they, they attach it to muscles. They attach it to uh, being toned, you know, but a lot of people, man, I don't, I don't, I don't think a lot of people follow bodybuilding like I do, but um, just recently, man, this year, four, four or five professional bodybuilders, man, just die and they're young. They're young. They're under 45. So they dying. You got these bodybuilders, man, you, they look phenomenal on stage, but the stuff they put their bodies through after a while, the bodies just quit. They look great, but their bodies just quit, man. And they got, they got uh blood clots floating around. Uh, testosterone is all off now because they taking steroids. They, all this stuff people are doing in the name of fitness and bodybuilding. That's not healthy. Now the gym is a part of it. But the biggest part of health is your diet. It's the one thing that most people have a hard time controlling is what goes in your mouth. So go into it more. Don't stop. No. <laughs> so, so what Eat, my, eating and drinking good. Go, go into that yeah. and, and go into your product because you, you offer okay. stuff. Yeah. So eating um, just being and it's hard too because, I mean, you drive up and down the bypass. We got fast food like crazy. Jeez. Man, and, and and with the lifestyle we have, fast food is 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 accessible, and it's it's easier than going home and cooking a whole meal, cause we're moving. You know, you got your own stuff, and then you got the stuff your kids are doing. So by the time you get home, cooking some meatloaf and macaroni and mashed potatoes, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, so it's hard. It's really hard. It's a hard thing nowadays to eat healthy. Plus, it costs more. You know. So, man, it's it's a sacrifice, man, but and I don't and uh, it's 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 hard to put your finger on why why America is that way. Why is the economy making being healthy harder? You know, that's that's a whole nother whole nother uh session, but uh It always seemed was was worse for you feel and taste better. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. That's just kind of how the world, you can take that back to spiritual things even, but just on the surface, it's like, what's worse for you always appeal to be better. Right. Some kind of way. Right, man. So the key to health, man, is what you put, what you put in your mouth, man. Um, you can't hamburgers and all that, you know, in moderation. But the bad thing about hamburgers and sugar is it's addictive. You know, uh, eating too much sugar is like taking drugs. Your body, they get a high off sugar. So the more you eat, the more you want. And it's the same with just fatty foods. Man, you eat um, pizza, and the next day, man, you're like, dang, I got a taste for. 
What does that mean you got a taste for? I got a taste for some cheeseburgers and pizza. Why? Because you're remembering what just took place. Your body's like, hey, I want that again. Why? Because it, it hit me. It hit, it hit different. You know, it made my dopamines and stuff, man, just pop. I need some more of that. So it's like you got to get to a point of discipline to where you change your palate to eating healthy. And so I came out with uh, Refiner's health and nutrition so first to start off with my book you know um the transformer embracing the refiner's fire and that's about learning from life so i just felt it was suitable to have hey have a, re a refining process by changing how you view food and supplements so my supplements aren't fitness led they're not they're not fitness focused so then you don't see the creatines the nitric oxide um, all that stuff, our weight loss pills, that's not what I went for because it wasn't fitness that I was trying to aim at. I was wanting to focus on health. Mm -hmm. So I got stuff for like CoQ10. You know, most people don't know what that is. I don't. Right. <clears throat> so that's good for heart health and blood pressure. Mm -hmm. I got high levels of omega-3s. Omega-3, man, it is fully, it's functional on many different levels. It helps with many different things. Um, then you got um, uh, stuff for cholesterol, stuff for joints, full turmeric with ginger and bioprene. People don't know what that is, but man, it's an amazing product. Um, I got stuff, man, that ranges GI tract. So I got a cleanser along with a probiotic and digestive enzymes. Most people are walking around here with pounds, hear me, pounds of crap in their system. Belly's all bloated. Why? Because you, you pretty much full of crap. So you got to clean that out or you got, you'll have colon problems, polyps. You can have diverticulitis. You can have GERDs. You can have all kinds of digestive problems because you're walking around with fecal matter just in your system. and It's not flushing out. So my line is geared towards that. So if you go to my website, uh, can I plug it? Of course. Okay. So it's www.refinershealthandnutrition.net. Okay. So you go there, and you if you look at the products, man, they fully explain what they're good for. Then up underneath the description, it tells you what you can blend it with so it have a synergistic effect in your body. Mm. So I try to break it all down. Whatever whatever you need to know about each product, it's on there. And I'm going to put that link in the description so that people would, would know that because that's, that's really important, man, so that we can try to live young because it's crazy. I'll be 32 next week on the 10th of May. And it seemed like when we was growing up, you know, we both, I'm still at Greater Second. We grew up in Greater Second. And it seemed like I used to hear older uh, older people growing up say that you didn't get old till you were 75. Mm. I don't know. I don't know about you growing up, but but I used to hear older people be like, like, like child, you ain't you ain't old till you hit 75. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. You never well, heard it? All the thing I've been heard, all the thing I hear is. I'm talking uh, about growing up. Oh, no, I didn't get an age. They didn't give me no age. You know, you was old when you said you was old. Okay. <laughs> I, I always I always heard that you you ain't, you ain't get old till you hit, you know, 70, 75. Then you could think about getting old. My grandma used to always tell me that too. But nowadays, people not making it to 60. Mm -mm. Not my grandfather didn't. Mm. He, well, he, he died at 66, man. And, and that's sad yeah. because... If you think about living to 90, 85, 90, 95, that's like 30 years plus right. after 60. Right. That's right. a whole new, you know. It's almost your, it's your lifetime again. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So we, I, I'm there and a lot of people need to be there. We got to do better um, in America with with that. I, I, I got to get into this. Um, we both from man, Indiana. We both live in man, Indiana. We both serve differently. Let's talk about, as we wrap this up, I want to talk about the importance of entrepreneurship in Marion. Mm. There's a lot of people who want to start things up and they may not want to start it up to get rich, but they may, they may have a skill set. They may have a vision or whatever that they want to turn into some kind of business, some kind of side hustle, maybe just for the benefit of the kids, mm -hmm. just to leave in. 
Why is entrepreneurship necessary? I, I know it's not for everybody. Dame Dash said that if you ain't if you got a boss, then, <laughs> you, ain't a then, <laughs> then you ain't a man. He a daddy. Yeah, but yeah. we know that business is not for everybody. Right. But I feel like it's important for mm-hmm. as many people who who are capable of, of doing it. It's at least worth a try. Yeah. Even if it fails. Right. So I know I know I just went long winded, but why why is that important for for people in Marion, Indiana? And abroad, but especially Marion, why is that important that that we have more entrepreneurs? Well, I think to answer it simply, I'm gonna give you a simple answer than the long answer. Okay. Uh, simply, man, small business has always run America. Okay. You know. And what would you define a small business? Because that seems to have many different definitions. A small business for me would be like 25 employees or less. Okay. Um, small business, man. The America is made up of local. Um, small towns, you know, you don't have a lot of major corporations like in Marion. You don't have major corporations in Marion. Marion is composed of small business, you know. Um, so small businesses, man, run America. Um, it's important that everybody who can, because they create jobs, they stimulate the economy. Um, but for the employee, the the owner. It allows that person, because obviously that person is someone who is creative. It gives you space to control your time. It gives you space, man, to control like how how you can affect people. Like you you are now uh over like people and you can affect how they go home. You can affect their lives, man. I don't know when I was actually a worker. How many times, man, you go to work and you people don't leave the job because the job is bad. They leave the job because leadership is bad. Man. You know? Uh, how many times you go to work, man, you go, man, I got to deal with this dude again. It, it's not the job that's hard. It's not the job really that's bad. If you had good leadership, man, people would stay. Even when you have tough days, they stay and they work hard for somebody who treats them with respect and treat them like I care about you as a person. You know, so I like I have the chance now to show good leadership Mm -hmm. and I got people working for my mom works for me, you know, and uh, they work for me, man. When I ask them for something, they show up when I ask them to hold the hold down station while I do this, I come back and they take they take pride in reaching the goals that I set. Hey, man, we about to reach that goal you set for us. How many people do that? But as owners, man, you get the the ability to affect lives. Okay. You get the ability, man, because um, time. You get the ability to control your time. Time spent, man. You spend time doing things. So time is the currency of life. So if you can control your time, you control the currency of life and where, it's go, where it goes, and you can prioritize it. So, um, man, if you got a dream, pursue that thing because – you're you're not just affecting you and your life, but you're affecting the lives of people that you employ. You stimulating the economy. I mean, you just you doing your thing. And this is like around here, people are actually stepping out and um, doing entrepreneurial endeavors. You man, I don't know if you've seen it. You probably you've seen it. The way how Marion feels like it's it's being revitalized through business like that. Yeah, so. it it is. Um, we're trying to get the creative arts more. Yeah. To be employed more, it's hard. It's hard for small cities to catch that wave, but there definitely is a new a new wave of entrepreneurship here. So that's the first phase of the question. Second phase for those who have already taken that leap mm-hmm. and are building our businesses. You know, we're the only ones working, and we're trying to scale. You know, to have employees to be able to more so work on the business and not in the business or for the business. What is your advice to people like that? To to because ribbon cuttings are cute, mm-hmm. awards and newspaper articles, all this stuff is, is you know is dope. But scaling is that's <laughs> that really shows you the the man or woman you say you are. I find myself right there. So what what is your advice to people who find themselves already mm-hmm. owning businesses but seem stuck and can't progress? Man, it's always good. See, with, luckily, with State Farm, um, they give you someone who 
can ride along with you a little bit. You know, not necessarily a business guru, but it's somebody to bounce ideas off of and that they can give you some sound advice just within State Farm. But you got to have it. As far as business, dude, it's, it's all me. But how to navigate through State Farm, I luckily I had this one person. It's called my sales team leader. So he comes through and he goes, hey, State Farm, this is how, how this is how it goes. This is what they expect. This is how you get that. You know, so for my first two years, um, my sales team leader was there for me to bounce. Say, hey, this is what's going on here. What you think about that? And he go, hey, this is when I was in your shoes. This is what I did. So you might want to try that. So it's always good to have somebody, a mentor, someone who has been in your shoes and has been successful at it. I would I would always advise never take advice on how to do something from somebody who hasn't done it. You know, I mean, but you'll find your life is always full of people who haven't succeeded at nothing in your life, nothing in their life, trying to give you advice. Yeah. You know, man, squash that. But it's always good to have somebody who's been in your shoes. They've walked that path because the path of entrepreneurship, man, is like it's hills and valleys. The whole stretch. Hills and valleys, man. You feel like you're on top of the world one one moment. And then all of a sudden, you're like, what just happened? Why is everything so hard? Like, what is, and you're trying to put your finger on it, and you're putting out like seven fires, and you didn't know how the fire started. You didn't even know what's causing them. So, but that's entrepreneurship, man. It's this roller coaster. Um, the luck, the good thing, luckily, is that, like, say your, 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 the bottom part of your valley is here. When you go to this next mountaintop, the valley bottom goes up. So it's a it's a valley, but it ain't as low as it was a year ago, you know. So it gets better, but you still have these peaks and valleys. So it's always good to have an advisor man out there, you know, find someone that can help you and listen, you know, make sure you just like, hey, here's the truth about about the matter. And what do you think, you know, I, how you think I should fix it? You know, and if he'll give you some sound advice, listen and carry it out. You know, um, there's no ego in success. You know, there's no ego in getting money, you know, because at the end, I mean, no one knows what's going on with you and your advisor except for you and your advisor. But who gets the glory when you win? You know, who shines? You shine. So no matter what it takes, man, there's no ego in success and getting success and getting money, man. There's no I got that from Puffy. (laughs) (laughs) And he got a whole lot of money, man, whole lot. Man, that's a that's that's a lot. We gotta wrap up with, with, with one more, man. Um This is good. This episode packed with a lot, man. Um The city of Marion, historically known as an industrial city, blue collar. We can just really say that for the Midwest. Yep. Mine is Chicago, which Chicago got an art scene, but it still is mm-hmm. a blue a blue collar city all in all when you really look at it. So, you know, it's a lot of when you take Marion, known for manufacturing and uh, industry, and really, I mean, I mean, some basketball, but our backbone is the manufacturing industry. Right. Now we're trying to have that innovation of entrepreneurship, small businesses, and the younger generation, and that's cool. But you still have people who have been around a long time who say they want change. But they really don't want change, or some of them just flat out mm-hmm. don't want change. From your, you sit on several boards. Yeah. You, you, you know leadership on all kind of levels in the community. Like, what is it really going to take for Marion to become at least a city where people can can be brought up here and at least go out, you know, mm-hmm. and be ready or stay here and become something? Yeah, I. I'm a true believer that wherever you're planted, you're planted there for a reason. Um, like I'll never run to try to get success. I don't, I don't think you have to. I think there is always a way for you to get success where you're planted. You just got to know the route. You just got to know how to get it, you know? Um, but man, like you said, we're, we're in this area where um, progression is kind of stagnant. Or it's being hindered, per to, yeah, per se, um, by people who's been around for a while. Um, I think it could be two, one of two things. 
um, it could be a uh, uh, a power struggle. They just don't want um, they don't want to change because I just like it the way it is, and my life is good, and I want to protect that. It could be that, or it could be that I just don't trust the ones who are trying to take over. So um, it could be yeah, it could be a power struggle, or it could be a trust issue. So what we got to do is kind of um, weed that out. What is it? You know, so if we have qualified people that want to progress and push the economy in this city forward, um, then we got to have those people stand up, be recognized and be supported. So you got people that are able to be leaders, but then everybody wants to be a leader that's not qualified. You got I think you got what. So so what qualifies a leader is somebody who is able to execute. Okay. Somebody who has vision, somebody who um, somebody who has vision and can execute the vision. Execution is the problem. Everybody has an idea. Everybody has a plan, what they think should happen. But then do you have, can you execute? A leader can execute and troubleshoot. So if we got people that are able to have a vision, make a plan, and ex- execute the plan with some integrity and honor. The rest of the community man, should be supporting those people. Those are the ones you want to push. Hey, we'll get behind you because we trust in you. You are going to push us forward. But you got too many people, man. I man, I don't want to do. I don't want to do it that way. I don't know about that. Ah, blah 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 blah. And it's like, man, then you don't want progress. But for those who want progress, you got to get behind those who can execute, man. Yeah, it's too many people in the city of man for us to to name. But salute to everybody that is uh, true leaders wherever you serve at, because Lord knows this city is a hard place. It's hard, man, to innovate. But it is slowly but surely uh, happening, man. Look, Keenan, we got. Look, I don't care. You sound wearing it out. Look, man, <laughs> turn it up louder, man. Hey, man, we we got to give it up for Keenan. It's a lot of gems. I feel like we got to do a part two because I, I don't even feel like. No, we just I just give him the service on some stuff, man. They ain't had to have a podcast together to even even do. I'm trying to get this man to start his own podcast. He won't he won't he said know, he ain't man. got time, man. But I feel like he got a lot of gems where he can give us a season, man. But brother, we appreciate you stopping through. Is there anything else you wanna you wanna pub to the people? No, man. Uh you got frequency canvas, man. <laughs> Shoot, man. You got your CDs, boy. Do they know who you are? <laughs> hey man, I hope I hope so one day, man. Yeah, I hope, man. I hope they do, man. You're big time in here, man. I like the environment and everything. I mean, I walked in here to talk to you and you just bust stuff out. Look what this does. Look what this does. Look what this does. I'm like, oh shoot, this boy. I know, man. I may I may <laughs> I, I may being nerdy look cool, man. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But hey man, we appreciate y'all for tuning in. Tune in for episode four whenever that comes. I'm gonna keep trying to deliver some content. I don't know how consistent I'm going to do this because this is not what I normally do. But I appreciate y'all for rocking. King of Davis State Farm, Refiners Health and Nutrition, Echo Gallery. Oh, yeah. All that stuff, man. So stay locked in with us, man. We appreciate y'all. All right, y'all.